on this Tuesday night, Donald Trump's tariff threat. His vow to impose 25% tariffs on all goods from Canada and Mexico. And would jack up the price of everything. Can a Team Canada approach work this time, plus what Trump is demanding be done at the border? Israel and Hezbollah agree to a ceasefire, the deal that could bring peace on one front of Israel's war. Decision Nova Scotia, Canada's fourth provincial election in only two months. And her father's ashes caught in the Canada Post strike. I just can't comprehend how that can happen. How the labour dispute is compounding one woman's grief. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. There are calls for Canadian unity in the face of a threat from U.S. President-elect Donald Trump. Trump doesn't take office until January, but he is already going after his neighbours, promising to impose 25% tariffs on all goods imported from Canada and Mexico until both countries crack down on migrants and drugs coming across the border. It's not a big surprise Trump has been threatening tariffs for months. The question is how Canada responds. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau called Trump last night and is holding an emergency meeting with the premiers tomorrow. BC's premier tweeted today, Canadians must stand united. Ottawa must respond with strength. So what do we need to do? We have to show the Americans that uh, we're serious about border security and we're serious about tackling the drug crisis. We have, from Quebec to United States, $87 billion of exportation and only 43 billion of importation. So we cannot start a war. We have team coverage of this story, beginning with Mackenzie Gray and the challenge of confronting a second Trump administration. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. It's another tiff over tariffs. Canada needs to be united. We need to be strong and we need to be smart. Justin Trudeau trying to do that last night calling Donald Trump after he threatened on social media to slap a 25% tariff on any Canadian and Mexican good going to the U.S. unless both countries deal with drugs, in particular fentanyl, and all illegal aliens. This is a relationship that we know takes a certain amount of working on, and that's what we'll do. A senior Canadian government source saying the Prime Minister underscored that Canada only has a fraction of the migrants who cross into the U.S. compared to Mexico. When we talk about the north-south flow of migrants, it really isn't as much, uh, obviously, as what's happening in Mexico. It's about a heavy weekend on the Mexican border on a yearly basis. Doesn't mean we don't take it seriously. Same goes for fentanyl. U.S. border guards confiscated nearly 20 kilograms of fentanyl coming from Canada in 2023. From Mexico, it was nearly 10,000 kilograms. I want to emphasize to compare us to Mexico is the most insulting thing I've ever heard from our friends and closest allies. A frustrated Doug Ford and the rest of the premiers will meet with Trudeau tomorrow, where the Liberals' goal is to get Team Canada on the same page, but Alberta might go it alone. We are the best proponents of our own interests, and we will continue to establish those relationships. I'd very much like to take a Team Canada approach, but I can tell you that uh, Justin Trudeau hasn't made it easy. Pierre Polyev calling the tariff threat unjust, but sharing a similar sentiment to Daniel Smith. We need a plan. A plan to put Canada first on the economy and on security. While the president-elect has used tariff threats as a negotiating tactic before, the head of Canada's largest private sector union warns, be prepared for Trump to follow through. I believe this isn't about borders or drugs or any of those sorts of things. This is about redirecting investment to the United States. Mackenzie is with me now. Mackenzie, this will be round two of Trudeau dealing with Trump, and Trump's bullying negotiating tactics aren't a surprise to anyone. Does experience give Trudeau a bit of an edge here? Uh, it certainly does, Donna, and that was underscored in part last night when Trump took Trudeau's call so quickly after he posted about the tariffs, and that is a good sign for the PM, but overall it will be an uphill battle for the Liberals because many of Trump's new cabinet picks have publicly said they don't like Trudeau and want Pierre Polyev as prime minister, and that's a dynamic with a federal election coming next year that will also likely play out domestically. Watch for federal opposition and the premiers to be considerably less amenable compared to the last NAFTA negotiations, Donna, where there was complete unity on what was needed to save the Canadian economy. Okay, Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa, thanks.
The economic impact of tariffs, which amount to a tax, would be so big even the threat is having an impact. The Canadian dollar fell more than half a cent today and is trading below 71 cents U.S., the lowest it's been since 2020. Trump has said tariff is his favorite word. Eric Sorensen explains why he loves tariffs and what imposing them could mean for Canada's economy. Are tariffs really coming on all that trade across the Canada-U.S. border? U.S. President Trump has made it clear he believes tariffs will prompt more companies to manufacture at home and more U.S. consumers to buy American. It's going to have a massive effect, positive effect. It's going to be a positive, not a negative effect. Even before tariffs are levied, the threats could spur investment in the U.S., potentially at Canada's expense. Growth picture in the U.S., looks to be quite strong, at least in the first half of 2025. Um, Now that means that Canada tends to be losing out. More than three quarters of all Canadian trade goes to the U.S. That was $569 billion in 2022. The main Canadian exports, crude oil and vehicles. Now from the U.S. to Canada, $400 billion in trade. The top product, also vehicles. It shows how much back and forth there is in that sector alone. Now tariffs and potential counter tariffs from this country would add costs to exports and ultimately to consumers on both sides of the border. The tariff is based a tax. Uh, it's paid by the business uh, importing the good, in this case to the U.S., but in most cases fully passed along to c- customers. Trump says he's focused on addressing drugs and immigrants, a sign that allies will do his bidding, says this analyst. I'm going to show that there's a new sheriff in town, I'm in charge, and I can use America's power and clout to get real policy gains. But is it just an early tactic? I simply can't ignore this news. U.S. business news channels are taking Trump seriously. I would take the president at his, uh, the incoming president at his word. He'll probably do something. The response from the other Trump targets, Mexico is fighting back. No es aceptable. It's not acceptable. It will mean job losses, says Mexico's president, while China is taking a softer approach. And see what we can do together to promote for global trade. Trump's tariffs could contravene the Canada-U.S.-Mexico trade agreement, which means they could also prompt an early renegotiation of the deal. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. And what about the border? Trump's concern about migrants and drugs flowing into the U.S. is mostly about the southern border with Mexico. But there is a growing problem on the northern border, too. A significant rise in migrants being smuggled from Canada into the U.S. Taria Isri has a reality check on the illegal crossings and the flow of drugs from Canada to the U.S. This fence runs along Alain de la Bruyere's property, which has become an illegal border crossing between Vermont and Quebec. He lives on the U.S. side and says he's seen the number of crossings surge. Well, there was 10 people inside the SUV. There were little kids and then the grown-ups. De La Bruyere says smugglers have driven vehicles right through his backyard. He's installed rails to stop them. They're running across the road. But there's not much he can do to prevent people from walking across. There's been so many crossings here. I've seen so many crossings with people and and you just don't know what their their stage of mind is when they're crossing. They're anxious to get through. De La Bruyere welcomes the Trump administration's crackdown. It's an extreme national national security vulnerability. It's illegal to cross here. Republican lawmakers have been increasingly critical of Canada on immigration. We have an open uh, uh, border policy. We have disjointed agencies. We are a significant uh, threat to U.S. border security. U.S. Border Patrol made nearly 24,000 arrests at the Canadian border between October 2023 and September of this year, an average of 65 a day. That number has been falling and last month stood at 41 daily. We totally understand the American concern around the security and integrity of the border. It's a concern that obviously Canadians share. The government of Canada has exactly those same concerns. It's not simply one dimensional, meaning that Canada has to do something by itself to quote, fix the problem. Because I suspect it's a a bilateral problem. Some national security experts now suggest deploying regional police forces and the RCMP to help with border patrol. 
But with less than two months until Trump retakes office, there isn't a lot of time to implement those significant changes. Donna? All right, Turia Isri in Montreal, thanks. U.S. President Joe Biden says a ceasefire deal has been reached between Israel and Hezbollah. Effective at 4 a.m. tomorrow local time, the fighting across the Lebanese-Israeli border will end. Civilians on both sides will soon be able to safely return to their communities and begin to rebuild their homes. The deal means both sides must gradually withdraw from Lebanon's border region, setting the stage for an end to nearly 14 months of fighting. Redmond Shannon reports. Oh my God. In the hours before an anticipated calm came a storm of airstrikes. Evacuation orders forced residents to flee areas of Beirut that had not previously been hit in this conflict. Israel claims to have struck 180 targets in Lebanon in one day. Hours later, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu confirmed this part of Israel's multi-front war is set to be paused asking his cabinet to approve a deal that would see Israel and Hezbollah withdraw from the border region of southern Lebanon, having Lebanon's national army and UN forces take on peacekeeping. Netanyahu, however, warns that Israel will respond forcefully if Hezbollah even tries to rearm. The Iran-backed group has been severely weakened by Israel killing its leaders, targeting its members and its infrastructure. On the other hand, it seems unlikely Israel's war goal of returning residents to its far north can happen anytime soon. On Sunday, Hezbollah fired 250 rockets into Israel. So both parties cannot claim victory, but definitely uh, if you want to score the points, uh, it's Hezbollah that is more damaged. This analyst says fixing Lebanon's broken government and making its army stronger are key to stability. U.S. President Joe Biden says the truce should be permanent and wants to seize this momentum. The United States will make another push to achieve a ceasefire in Gaza. The humanitarian situation in Gaza is many times more horrific. The conflict likely much more difficult to solve too. This man in Gaza says he's happy for Lebanon, but he says because the two wars started together, they should end together. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Ukraine claims Russia has launched 188 drones, a record number, causing damage to buildings and the power grid in western Ukraine. And in the east, Russian troops are pushing hard. At least two people were killed in shelling in the northeast. Crews rushed to douse flames and dig through the debris for survivors. Three weeks after a British Columbia teenager became the first confirmed human case of avian flu in Canada, the province's top doctor says it's still not known how the teen became infected. Dr. Bonnie Henry says there are no additional cases and no evidence of human-to-human -human transmission. Public health officials did extensive contact tracing and found the virus matched a strain found in two geese in B.C.'s Fraser Valley. The teen is in stable but critical condition. Paul Bernardo, the serial killer who murdered two teenagers in Ontario decades ago, has been denied parole for a third time. 15-year-old Kristen French and 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey were tortured and murdered in the early 1990s near St. Catharines, Ontario. The mothers of both girls had strongly urged Canada's parole board to deny Bernardo parole. Today it agreed, saying Bernardo, who is now 60, was still at risk of reoffending. Seeking a second term. Coming up, will voters in Nova Scotia give the Tories another majority mandate? Polls have closed in Nova Scotia's provincial election. Incumbent progressive Conservative Premier Tim Houston called the snap election earlier than he needed to, hoping to win a second majority, and he has succeeded. Global's Megan King is at PC Party headquarters in New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. Megan, how big a victory is this for the progressive Conservatives? 
Oh, Donna, this is a huge victory for the PCs. This is exactly what they wanted to see. They called this election early. As you can hear, a lot of cheering going on as those election results come in. They already, we've already called a majority government. This is very, very fast, especially considering we didn't start seeing these results until 9 p.m., which is an hour later than we thought we would he out here on the East Coast. Um, and as you can hear, they're very excited to see this type of uh, type of result. They called this election a split uh, uh, election ahead of time just to make sure that they could get that return of the majority. And they did succeed already counting this. We're deep in the heart of Blue count, uh, Country here in New Glasgow in the Picto area, which is actually where uh, PC leader Tim Houston is from. Um, with that in mind, we know that uh, a lot of people came out to support him today. And and this is a new mandate as well. Uh, they used to be all about health care. That's what they won on in 2021. But this time around, things are changing. Uh, Nova Scotians' priorities are changing as well. Cost of living, housing crisis coming to the top of mind in Halifax, 1% vacancy for a lot of people renting in the city. So there's new priorities. They're hoping that their new ideas come forward and they can bring them into the second term. Of course, it seems that they have succeeded in that. People seem to be at least happy enough to keep them around for a second term with Houston as premier. Uh, very much a lot of excitement in the room. Speeches are just moments away. We're very excited to hear those as well. Uh, but as far as it goes in New Glasgow, it's very sad as to what this election turnout has been. Another win for those PCs here. Progressive Conservatives taking their second term in office under Houston. I'll send it back to you for now. All right, Megan King in New Glasgow, Nova Scotia. Thanks. Coal mining comeback ahead. What people in one part of Alberta have to say about a controversial new mine. More than 40 years after coal mining ended in southwest Alberta, there's a debate about its return. On Monday, people in Crow's Nest Pass voted in favor of a new coal mine in their community. Coal is the dirtiest of fossil fuels, and Canada produces 48.8 million tons of it. The vast majority, 37.5 million tons, is exported to markets in Asia. The vote in Alberta is not binding, but as Heather Yorick's West reports, it is a sign of the times in the province. Where ranch lands meet the Rockies, the Crow's Nest Pass in southwest Alberta is a place of staggering beauty. It's also home to several coal mining communities that for the last 40 years have been without a coal mine. We need industry in here. There's, you go drive up and down the street and see how many blank, there's, no, there's nobody in there. They're all empty buildings. And so perhaps it's no surprise that when residents were asked whether they supported a new coal mining project at Grassy Mountain, 72% voted yes. That sends a clear, crystal clear message back to council, um, how our community feels, and that was the whole purpose of this vote. The results of the referendum are not binding. A previous proposal submitted in 2016 was eventually rejected by the federal government. The project will need provincial and federal approval before it's good to go. The local support means so much to North Back. The, with this, now we move forward with uh, re working on a revised mine plan and bringing it forward to the regulators. Now because of the watershed, the potential environmental impacts of mining at Grassy Mountain extend far beyond the Crow's Nest Pass. Two hours to the north here in High River, residents have serious concerns about the development as well. When you're messing with our watersheds, that involves all of us. And I don't care where you live, you should be very, very concerned. The project's next steps will be heard by Alberta's energy regulator next month. Opponents are also challenging it through the courts. So while the vote may have been decisive, this debate is far from done. Heather Urex West, Global News, High River, Alberta. Devastating delay next. Why this woman can't lay her father to rest. Countless letters and packages are stuck in transit because of the Canada Post strike. It's an inconvenience for many, but for one woman in Quebec, it is devastating. Emily Wallstrom was supposed to lay her father to rest before Christmas. As Felicia Perillo reports, the labour dispute means his ashes are now stranded in a Canada Post facility in B.C. 
I flew there and got to meet him for the first time. Emily Wallstrom only has a handful of photos with her father. She met him for the first time last year during an emotional reunion in Surrey, B.C., they had plans to see each other again. But in late October, he passed away suddenly from lung disease. There's decades of questions that have always been there that I've wanted to ask him and find out and know. Wallstrom says a Vancouver funeral home shipped her his ashes on November 12th via Canada Post and they were expected to arrive at her home in Il Perot on the 20th. But she says once workers went on strike, her tracking information indicated that the remains were stuck in a facility in Richmond, B.C. and would be delayed. It's hard to understand how my father's remains are just left aside somewhere. It, it doesn't, it, I just can't comprehend how that can happen. In a statement to Global News, a Canada Post spokesperson said, this is a difficult situation and we sympathize, but unfortunately the Canadian Union of Postal Workers' decision to launch a national strike means we're not able to process or deliver items. Any mail and parcels in the postal network have been secured and will be delivered on a first-in, first-out basis once operations resume. The union did not respond to Global News's request before deadline. Wallstrom is calling on both sides to include human remains in their agreement of essential items that are still being delivered during the labour dispute. I can't be the only one who's wondering where their loved one has ended up. The whole situation just becomes undignified. Wallstrom had plans to lay her father to rest during the holidays where he grew up in Manitoba. Now she worries that won't be possible until the spring. Felicia Perillo, Global News, yeah. Il Perot, Quebec. That is Global National for this Tuesday. We don't often talk about ourselves, but tonight we want to acknowledge an achievement. Global Special Correspondent Danielle Hamamjan, along with camera editor Mark Damour and senior producer Kieran O'Dee, have won the Foreign Press Association Award for Story of the Year in London. It's for their story about life for Palestinians living in the West Bank. The judges said the story gave extraordinary access in a very dangerous area that opened a rare and timely window onto the reality of life under occupation. Congrats to the whole team. Thanks for watching and hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye-bye.